Hello, my name is Rob Evans and I'm the School Security Liaison Officer for Vermont's Agency of Education and Department of Public Safety. And I'm pleased to have with me Ms. Emily Harris from the Department of Public Safety's Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Emily and I wanted to speak with you today about some significant changes and enhancements that have been made to the Vermont School Crisis Planning Guide. In working with the School Crisis Planning Team, these enhancements will make it more user-friendly for you to use this guide and assist you um, in, in preparing uh, your emergency response plans at schools across the state. Just wanted to turn the microphone over to Emily to talk about uh, the enhancements that have been made in the guide. Thank you so much, Rob. So many of you are familiar with the old Vermont School Crisis Guide, and there's a lot of good information that is still in there for the 2016 version. One of the problems with the old school crisis guide was that you needed to know the name of the document you were looking for in order to find it because it was all alphabetical order. So new this year what we've done is we've categorized the different plans into the different phases of emergency management to help you find what you're looking for in that phase. Another exciting thing that we've done is we've converted all of the documents so you'll be able to access them all in Microsoft products which you've historically been able to do or you can download them all through Google Drive because we know a lot of schools are moving towards that direction. We've updated our four phases of emergency management document to clarify what those different phases are and some actions you may want to do um, in those phases. We've also put this at the front of the guide so that way if you don't know what phase you're looking for, this will help you. We've also added a new acronyms and terms guide, and we've been consistent throughout the guide in the language that we use. That language is also consistent with federal guidance and also some trainings that you may attend this summer. So Emily, the, the four different phases, those are in keeping with the national standards as far as what FEMA and, and other emergency preparedness agencies are, are talking about. That is correct. And it also helps you when you're planning. So you don't necessarily need to look in the recovery phase when you're looking for something that's a mitigation activity. So prevention and mitigation, this is the section where you're doing things before something happens to maybe prevent an event. Um, and we've got a risk assessment, a safety and security of school buildings and grounds checklist, as well as the threat assessment, which was added to the guide last year. This risk assessment document has been modified significantly, so I'd like to draw your attention to it. Previously, the risk assessment in the school crisis guide decide your risk for you. This document, again consistent with federal guidance, allows you to analyze your risk to particular threats and hazards. Once you've looked at your risk for those particular threats and hazards, those items that you identify as a high priority, you want to put your attention to first when it comes to planning or exercising. And Emily, on, on this risk assessment, schools uh, and supervisory unions, they can access other first response resources and local emergency management directors. What other resources do they have to assist them in this risk assessment? Oh yes, we would encourage everyone to work with their local emergency responders and their local emergency management director when working on this risk assessment. Those individuals have historical data about your area and what you should be putting into this guide. Um, you can also look at the state hazard mitigation plan which will provide you with some information about your region and what in general your region is susceptible. To. And the thing that I like about the prevention is we have all been talking about response to, to bad things that are happening in our schools. This really is uh, where we should be focusing our efforts from the risk assessment to our threat assessments. If we can stop some of these things from happening at our schools, that really is where we should be directing our attention. So in the development of your risk assessments and your familiarity with the threat assessment guide, those are really key things to stop bad things from happening. Yeah, and with the risk assessment, one of those conversations you should have with your emergency management director are, are there any mitigation activities we could do to prevent these things from happening? So let's say that you're at a high risk of flooding. Are there any things, any barriers you could put up that would prevent that flooding from happening? So that way we don't have to necessarily go into the response phase. Preparedness really gives you some items that you can do before something happens. So this isn't going to prevent something from happening, but it's going to get you ready to respond in the event that something does happen. We've added a couple of new things to this section. For example, the classroom preparedness kit, um, we've made some modifications to that. We've also added a duty roster. This duty roster allows you to identify before an event who your primary, secondary, and tertiary staff members are 
who could fill those roles. That allows you to train those staff members in filling those roles before something happens. Um, we've also added the emergency response actions uh, guide that you guys may have seen last year. We've made some modifications and the standard response protocol, which I'll actually let Rob talk about. So for the crisis commands in individual schools, a lot of you folks may have seen the emergency response actions guide um, that was uh, distributed last year that I know in, in, in a lot of our school safety visits across the state, schools really have done a great job in having these documents or this document on their the walls of their classrooms and in their common spaces and those types of things. And it really is an all hazards approach response guide to individual things that folks might be presented with as an emergency in a school, whether it's a violent intruder or a fire alarm or power outage, those types of things. The changes to this, though, is the incorporation of the standard response uh, protocols, which will change the, uh, the, the, the crisis commands that we're recommending for schools to, uh, to bring on. And those commands are lockdown, lockout, evacuate, and shelter. Again, it's a national standard, national best and promising practices that the Department of Justice's alert program uh, has put out. And, and on the right side of your screen, you will see uh, just kind of a, a, a collateral that you can put up, uh, kind of an educational tool for schools in the, in the elementary, middle, and high school level. And we really do encourage folks to get a standard uh, response protocol process taking place at all levels within the school. So what we're teaching our kindergarten kids to do is the same types of things that they'll be seeing all the way through 12th grade and even to the college uh, and university level. It is something that is, is, is going across the nation. Again, it is a best and promising practice nationally and we encourage uh, folks to take a strong look at this and get these things distributed throughout your school. One of the other exciting things about the standard response protocol is if we are consistent throughout the state and with other states, when our students move from school to school in different areas, they'll be using the same response protocol. So it'll make sense to them and they won't have to relearn something if they move out of Vermont to another state. And nothing keeps you from adding additional commands to this, but the, the thing that we like about the commands is that they really are an all-hazards approach. So if there's smoke in the building, it's evacuate. If it's a violent intruder, it may be locked down, uh, it may be evacuate. Uh, if there's a threat in the community that hasn't yet uh, made it to our schools, then, it, then it's a lockout type of, uh, of standard response protocol. So we really encourage you folks to, to take a look at this. And there will be more educational opportunities for us to talk a little bit more about how to apply this at your individual school. But it really is a significant change from where we have been in the past. And again, nothing discourages you from adding on to these commands uh, for specific things within your school. So now moving into the response phase, these are the plans you're going to use when something does actually happen. So one of the modifications that we've made to these plans is we've taken all of the individual roles and we've moved those up to the top so you can identify when something happens, what roles you're going to require, and who you've assigned to fill that role, rather than having to scan through the whole plan looking and then um, adding it to every line item. And the thing that I like about the response section is, depending upon the critical incident that you're dealing with, you literally get to choose that tab, go to that tab, and you've got suggested uh, response actions for individual role players uh, within your school environment. And again, as Rob said, these are suggestions. We're hoping that you will take a look at these before an event and make the modifications that are relevant to your school. Perhaps you don't have a school nurse that's there every single day and you're going to need someone else to fill that role. So really identifying what works best for your school. So moving into recovery, these are the items that you're going to look at when an incident is winding down and you need to think about returning to normal. So we have a, a plan for an active shooter recovery and then we also have a general school safety recovery. So those items in the short and long term that you want to be thinking also familiar to folks will be the appendix. You'll see that there's a lot less things in here because a lot of those were able to be moved out into a phase. But this appendix is for items that don't particularly fit in any one phase of emergency management and are just general good information. So for example, what I have on here is uh, the Vermont Statutes Online, the Good Samaritan Law. It doesn't fall to any one particular category. This is just general good information. So moving forward into June of, of 2016, 
we've heard from our stakeholders across the state that uh, they were looking for some guidance and, and some user-friendly tools to assist local uh, school crisis planning teams in doing some preparedness uh, efforts within their school. So what we have developed is a, a school safety training and awareness calendar where throughout your school year, we will focus you in areas that, uh, that match the federal guidance as far as what's, uh, being, um, what's being developed nationally as far as things to direct your attention to, whether it's uh, fire safety month or school bus safety, those types of things. And also identifying some key areas for us in specific times of the year uh, with weather-related events coming in November and other things throughout the year for you to prioritize on. These will be user-friendly for you. Uh, under the month, there will be a link where you can go to what Emily and I like to call some hip pocket training, where it will be Emily and I walking through some exercises that will focus in that focus area, 10 or 15 minutes, uh, designed to just foster some conversations and play the what-if game. If this were to happen at your school, who's responsible for it? Who's going to be the incident commander? Who do we collaborate for first response organizations? Again, understanding, we fully understand the capacity issue that folks have in schools. This really is designed to make it easy and simple for you. I want to talk about some, uh, some very uh, aggressive training efforts that we have going on across the state uh, in, in during the summer of 2016. And the first one is the very important training of the Incident Command System. It's ICS 200. And as you can see, we have a, a lot of locations across the state where these trainings are going to be taking place. And these are not out-of-state instructors that we are bringing in. Uh, these are in-state instructors that have a, a, a very good working knowledge about the Vermont-specific way of doing business. We've got folks that have worked in emergency management, state police background, former principals uh, in schools that will be doing this training. And I think it's extremely beneficial that folks uh, get to this. This will allow individual executive leaders within schools to understand how the response communication takes place when they're responding to a critical incident. How do you work with your first responders? How do you make decisions during a critical incident? Who should be sitting at the table? When should you be sitting at the table? It's two days worth of eight hours training each day, but at the end of it you walk away with a, a certificate of attendance and training, but it really more importantly it gets you engaged in the decision-making process during a critical incident. The next uh, training that we have offered this summer uh, is the EOP development course, which is uh, going to be provided by the folks at REMS, which is the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools. Two separate trainings. The first one on Monday, August 8th, is a Train the Trainer program. That's going to be from 9 till 5 at the Vermont Technical College in, uh, in Randolph. And what that is designed to do is to teach folks how to train other folks in how to develop a fully uh, developed emergency operations plan. It's an eight-hour course, but what that will do is allow you to build capacity either within your school or with your in individual supervisory union or school district and have trainers within your supervisory union or district that can go out and train others of how to, about to, uh, how to develop an emergency operations plan. The second day of training on Tuesday, August 9th is a Train the Educator. That course is designed for those that are sitting around the table in the school crisis planning team about all the key component parts and how folks should be developing uh, an emergency operations plan. We really won't get another opportunity for this training. I tell you, it was Emily did a great job in bringing this uh, to us here. We really won't get another opportunity to get this, and we strongly encourage folks within the schools to get to the training. We also are going to be offering it out to local first response organizations, emergency management directors in individual communities, folks at the uh, local emergency planning commission and the regional uh, planning commission, and any folks that might be involved in developing emergency operations plans within a community, we will advertise this and try to get as many of our stakeholders there for the training as possible. All the information on how to sign up for the training will be coming out in weekly field memos and through principals and superintendents associations. So if folks have specific questions about this, uh, you can absolutely give Emily or I a call and our contact information obviously was on the front of the PowerPoint. Uh, so we encourage folks to attend the training. We've had a lot of conversations already uh, about the traditional response to an active shooter and certainly our standard response protocols uh, move away from the traditional response of just locking down and, and locks light out of sight type of thing. 
Um, what we want folks to, to, and we encourage folks to continue the conversations about um, options-based response capacities where uh, we're not just sitting in a lockdown and waiting for bad things to come our way, but we're giving and empowering people to make individual life-saving decisions. And that's a significant change, and we understand that from where we've been in the past. Folks have already gotten engaged in, in a lot of the um, training opportunities that are out there, whether it's the I Love You Guys Foundation or Run, Hide, Fight or Alice, and folks are bringing these folks in to do this training, and we, we appreciate it and strongly encourage folks to educate themselves on what these different response methodologies are. But we also encourage folks that don't, don't make these decisions to move to these areas without having a broad-based conversation with your community, your, your internal and external partners, uh, local first response communities and those types of things to just make sure everybody is educated and informed about why we're moving away from just their traditional lockdown responses. What we've done here is just kind of classified each one of the individual trainings that, that are out there, um, some of the positives and, and limitations in some of those, the costs associated with some of those. Uh, is it school-based? Is it law enforcement-based? Uh, those types of things. The other thing on the far right of the screen is the coming storm video. If folks haven't had an opportunity to see that, that really is a, a great snapshot of what an active shooter, violent intruder situation might look like in your school. It was developed by the Department of Justice FBI's uh, Partner Engagement uh, Division. Uh, it's about a 25 or 30 minute video which really goes from the beginning of, of a threat assessment and a social media alert to a potential violent uh, uh, situation taking place at a school from the response to an active shooter uh, to the setup of unified command and public information, uh, tactical EMS, family reunification and recovery after, a, uh, after an active shooter on campus. Really is a great opportunity to see that and it also fosters conversations with your local first response community about how you might respond to an active shooter at your school. If you have not seen it, I would check with your local um, law enforcement or, or state police barracks. A lot of those folks have access to the video, and if you don't, and they don't, then you can certainly give me a call as well, and I can get you a, a copy of the video uh, to, to look at your school crisis planning team. What we wanted to talk about is just some, some new guidance that's coming out from the Agency of Education on best practices for schools regarding local implement, implementation um, on school safety. Uh, our, our previous language was a little bit vague and was not in keeping with best and promising practices nationally. It didn't talk about school specific EOPs or it conforming to the National Incident Management System, um, that we wanted it to be aligned with the school crisis planning guide, that it was going to be reviewed and updated uh, annually. Um, and what we really are focusing is if individual schools don't have a fully developed EOP, uh, the school crisis planning guide really should be the, the minimum standard guiding document that you have in the absence of a fully developed EOP. So that really is what we're saying is going to be the minimum standard for crisis response planning. Just wanted to thank you folks for taking an opportunity to, uh, to, to view the video. Certainly if you have any questions about the implementation or the school crisis planning guide specifically, I would encourage you to contact Emily about the document and its implementation and the planning process. If you have specific questions about training or wanted to have a conversation about the emerging trends uh, for a violent intruder or would like me to come in and visit your school or assist uh, your supervisory union and district in enhancing your emergency preparedness efforts, both Emily and I have been traveling around the state to have these conversations. I will tell you that the larger group of folks that we can speak with at the SU or district level, that's a bigger bang for the buck as far as Emily and I are concerned. So I would encourage you that if, if your SU or district at the superintendent's level would like to get a, a group of folks together within your SU to have these conversations, Emily and I would be happy to come in and have those conversations with you. Appreciate all the efforts that folks are doing locally. We have some great things happening across the state and just would encourage you to continue with this very important work. Thank you.